Okay, I want to welcome everyone to the uh, first hot lunch of uh, the 2021 uh, season. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that uh, we are gathered today, or at least I am, and I know some of you are in other places, but we are uh, at UBC campus uh, on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam uh, Hunkaminam speaking peoples. I know that many of you are um, coming in remotely, and so uh, please take this opportunity to, um, uh, to again, uh, think of whose ancestral territory you're living on or working from at this moment. Um, it's been a very eventful year, um, as, as many of you uh, know very well. Um, and so, you know, the Hot Lunch Committee, uh, we've, we've been really happy to, to kind of really brainstorm and think about how Hot Lunch, even uh, within COVID, can, can still be a way for, for staff uh, at UBC to get together and uh, interact. Uh, as some of you uh, know and participated in, we had a couple Hot Lunch events through the summer. Um, and so we're trying to, uh, really, you know, get better at using Zoom to, to create that sense of, uh, of community, um, even though we're not enjoying uh, Chef Clarence's uh, and, and his staff meal uh, together, we're, at least we're, we're together. I uh, want to acknowledge that the work that Stacy Barber and Jennifer Liu uh, have done um, at St. John's uh, College on the Hot Lunch Committee and, and, and they're supporting uh, today's uh, luncheon. Um, we also have Eilish Courtney, um, you know, senior advisor, ceremony and protocol on the hot lunch committee. Shirley Nakata, ombudsperson for students. Uh, Andrew Parr, managing director, or actually, I believe you're. It's a different title now. So, associate vice president, uh, um, student housing and community services. Um, and so, you know, we the the committee is is really committed to to hopefully uh, um, helping bring people together, um, despite the fact that we're so many of us are working remotely. And so we're really glad to actually have, uh, you know, again, for the fifth year in a row, uh, President uh, Ono um, open up uh, the, uh, the hot lunch for the year. Um, see, we have, uh, we will have, as people trickle in, I believe over 300 people signed up for this lunch. Um, so uh, again, one of the benefits, strangely enough, of a virtual hot lunch is that uh, we can go beyond the fire code capacity of uh, SJC's dining hall. And so um, uh, many more people hopefully can, can actually join us today than if we were in a room together. Um, uh, let's see, we won't be having, again, because of the large numbers of people for today's hot lunch, we won't be having breakout rooms. So our apologies, but uh, it worked really well during the summer and uh, to have uh, breakout rooms and many of you gave feedback that you really enjoyed being able to during hot lunch have these smaller breakout rooms to, to kind of you know smaller groups to, to discuss so we will return to that um, after uh, uh, this month's uh, hot lunch we'll have breakout rooms again in the future but I just wanted to, to let you know that we, we did hear a lot of uh, very positive feedback about the um, breakout rooms and allowing people to get together um, a couple things uh, that we're also looking forward to is that we know that many of you miss the actual lunch. And so um, Chef Clarence is actually uh, going to put together a, a, a launch a pilot program where, um, where he will prepackage lunches, uh, some of which are some of your favorites from Hot Lunch. And he'll also, because he has this wonderful staff of, of chefs from uh, Malaysia, India, Iran, he's going to also be doing some interesting um, prepackaged um, lunches. And so uh, you'll see at the end uh, um, a, a survey that you can answer. And so one of the questions will be, if you're interested in that, um, you know, it looks like probably it'll be like a $12 uh, little prepackaged and it can be hot or frozen. And so you can even... Uh, get a number for um, for your freezer. Uh, we know that a lot of people, me included, have been uh, hitting the frozen food uh, aisle and uh, and stocking up uh, just because of uh, working from home. And so, uh, again, um, we hope that you'll be able to enjoy hot lunch even at home, or maybe during the hot lunches you can uh, warm up uh, one of Chef Clarence's uh, uh, meals and, and join into hot lunches this year uh, with an actual hot lunch meal made by Chef Clarence. Um, so I, let's see, are there any other announcements? Uh, yeah, we, the format today will be, uh, President Ono will speak. Uh, many of you have sent in questions already. And so what we've done is uh, we've pulled a number of 
of those, especially questions that multiple people asked. Uh, and so uh, after uh, President Ono has uh, starts with about 10 minutes of remarks, um, I'll start to um, uh, pass some of these questions uh, to him to answer. And hopefully, you know, he'll have time to answer uh, all the, the voluminous numbers of questions that, uh, that were sent in um, for him to uh, consider. So in any case, without any further ado, I um, just wanted to turn it over to UBC's President and Vice Chancellor, uh, President Santa Ono, um, and uh, thank him again for opening up uh, our Hot Lunch series. Well, thank you very much, Henry. It's uh, really wonderful to be with you today, even though it's virtual. I'm actually swiping across my iPad screen so I can see your faces. It's not exactly the same as uh, this is the fifth annual uh, Hot Lunch. I, I don't have a Hot Lunch in front of me. Uh, and. Uh, um, the beautiful scene of all the paper boats uh, in, in, in that beautiful location. I look forward to the time that we can all be together again. Um, but I want to thank you all for joining us uh, for this annual tradition. And as um, uh, Henry said, I'm just going to give a, a, a few remarks, uh, but really uh, try to protect as much time as possible to answer the questions that you've sent in. And time permitting, I'm happy to answer uh, other questions that, that you might have today. Um, I hope that uh, you're having a good lunch. Some of you have waved your lunches at me. Some of you are not eating yet. Um, and I can see Jocelyn Beretta, who I talk to all the time with her. Oh, she's having her lunch and uh, she has guitars on her wall. And every now and then you'll see cats actually go back and forth in the background. But uh, this is a very unusual, who would have thought that we would be meeting this way through Zoom? But uh, thank goodness we do have technology. Can you imagine? If this happened, say, in the 80s or the 90s, before there were iPads and before there was the internet, so at least we can uh, stay together. And I hope that you you have been doing well. Um, I know that there are lots of challenges that are associated with this kind of uh, 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 pandemic and and the, and the changes that we've had had to make as an institution. And it's a very unusual September, and as you're probably hearing, there's a second wave, and you'll be hearing from. The Canadian government uh, about the increase in cases. You've heard from Dr. Bonnie Henry, you've heard from me. Um, so uh, the first thing I want to say is thank you so much for sticking together uh, during these challenges, challenging times. Thank you so much for uh, being vigilant uh, and doing everything that you can to remain connected, to remain kind to each other, and to, to adopt the public health uh, guidelines of UBC, the province, and, and Canada to do everything that we can to uh, flatten the curve, as they say, and to keep our community safe. Uh, it really requires each and every one of us to be committed to that, uh, because uh, as you know, this is a virus that spreads very quickly. And uh, there are those of us in our community and also our friends and family that we interact with that really depend upon each and every one of us being vigilant uh, during these times. Uh, this is a very unusual, uh, situation. I get to walk around campus um, um, on a regular basis with my dog Romeo that some of you may have met. And so I can see what the campus is like and it's very different uh, from what is usual. And some of you haven't been back on campus for some time. And I can tell you I ran into some students uh, yesterday night uh, who were actually um, projecting on the Chan Center and uh, on the film and theater buildings about uh, Light Up Live, which uh, was really, um, you know, essentially acknowledging the, the impact of, of COVID on performing arts in general. The fact that it was one of the first sectors to have to close down and it'll likely be one of the last sectors to open up again, because it really by definition requires lots of people getting together to watch dance or to watch acting or to watch theater. So, um, but I was speaking to those students and they were really talking about how different the campus is. And uh, um, all of us are dealing with uh, the changes in our lives that have been really uh, enormous and can cannot be under, uh, underestimated. So the campuses that are usually buzzing with people, people you know, shoulder to shoulder, especially between classes, uh, are very quiet. Um, 90, uh, 4% or so of, of our students are, are taking uh, classes remotely. And uh, occupancy of our residence halls, Andrew Parr is here, is just a small fraction of what it typically is. And I can say that it's probably a good thing because it allows for physical distancing, it allows for safety on our campus, 
not to underestimate the, the tremendous work of Andrew and the staff, some of you who are part of this hot lunch, um, but the, the fact that uh, residency uh, is, uh, is below normal is probably a good thing from a public health standpoint. Um, but you just have to walk around uh, the campuses uh, and, and see that, that things are very different. Uh, but I want to thank everyone uh, that's been involved in, in, in launching this, uh, this academic year. I can tell you we had a Board of Governors meeting yesterday and share with you that um, several governors uh, were so grateful with how we've started this academic year. All you have to do is, is switch on the television and see what's happening at many other universities that tried to be fully face-to-face -face and then had to actually tell them all to leave seven days or 10 days later or the thousands of COVID cases that are emerging in the many, many uh, campuses uh, south of the border, that uh, the conservative approach that we've taken, uh, the fact that uh, we have really been emphasizing physical distancing and, and, and hand washing, and, and most recently mandatory masks, um, all of those things I think come together as a constellation of measures that we're taking to ensure the safety uh, and wellness of faculty, staff, and students. So I want to thank you for everything that you've done um, to, to um, you know, make sure that uh, everyone around us uh, adopts those uh, public health measures. And also to thank you for everything you've done to launch things virtually. Um, many people have watched our, our, our uh, virtual Imagine Day and create our virtual graduation. Many of you have worked on that. And we've gotten comments and kudos from around the world for the quality of those uh, online uh, versions of, 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 of orienting students and, and faculty and graduating them. And uh, you should all be very proud of, of, of how the university has responded. Many of you have been incredibly hard at work working with faculty and students to transition on, in a matter of days from uh, having thousands of classes face to face and having them all uh, remote over the spring and over the summer terms and now uh, for this entire academic year. And we realize that it's been a gargantuan task. Uh, the faculty estimate that uh, they are working 67% more because of uh, the added uh, work of transitioning courses to, to a remote uh, mode of instruction. And you as staff have been working hard as well. And sometimes it's not been straightforward because you're at home and you have sometimes don't have childcare and you have kids crawling over you as you're trying to talk to people on Zoom. Um, and uh, so I realize that uh, all of you have also been doing a lot of heavy lifting, getting IRP ready uh, for launch on November 2nd. So I wanna thank you for your tremendous work uh, over this uh, unusual time. I'm very impressed with the resilience of the UBC community. Uh, we're gonna have a uh, virtual homecoming in a couple of days and uh, I've had a, the pleasure of working with many of you. Uh, you'll be seeing a sort of a, a, a workday commercial that I participated in. I hope you enjoy it. It's kind of funny. Um, and um, hopefully you'll enjoy some of the uh, um, interesting videos that, that will be released during the homecoming days on both campuses. So um, thank you for, for all of your work on making classes as rich as possible. Um, and supporting each other and making these uh, virtual uh, analogs of what we usually do uh, possible. I'm gonna get back a little bit to COVID. I apologize, but it's kind of a dominant theme. You probably heard my video message to the entire university community. I'm trying to do it on a weekly basis. Um, and thousands of people uh, watch it. So thank you so much for, for listening to me. Um, I discussed how we need to comply with provincial and university guidelines in, in order to flatten the curve. And if you don't mind, I'm gonna repeat it one more time, but not verbatim, but just the high points. Um, you've all been doing an incredible job. I can't really speak to actual numbers of cases, but they are uh, mainly on the periphery of, of the campuses. There have been very few cases. It's not my job uh, to actually um, announce when there are cases. Um, it's actually the uh, public health authorities. Um, it's their responsibility and their desire that they announce those. Um, they're uh, responsible for testing, as you know, they're responsible for contact tracing. Um, and just so you know that if they have everything under control, that people are quarantined and contact traced, they will not uh, release a, a public uh, message 
uh, you'll see that there have been some exceptions, like at UVic and at Rec Beach. Those are situations where they don't know the individuals. They're not, they don't know who to test. They don't know how to contact trace. But their their, their um, approaches to not uh, say something has happened here or there out of respect for privacy, because individuals may not want people to know that they, they might have been uh, uh, infected. Um, and so um, that's uh, really the approach that the BC Public Health um, has advised the university. So when you do hear from us about uh, cases, uh, say at Rec Beach, that's because they, they don't have a handle on who might have been infected and they can't trace. But otherwise, um, they'll be handling it. But I can say that uh, there have been very few cases, even in the periphery of, of our, our campuses. And I hope that, uh, that you're happy uh, with that. Uh, and let's hope, hopefully we can keep it that way. Um, we must continue to do this. Uh, we must continue to be successful. Uh, as provincial health officer, Dr. Bonnie Henry notes, masks are just one line of defense. So even though we have mandatory masks and it's gonna be very helpful, and we know that if two people are wear, wearing the mask, it really decreases the chance of infection. But we still have to physically distance two meters, for most of us, some cases, three meters, if you're singing or you're playing an instrument. Um, we have, as a, a community, worked very hard uh, to develop very, very detailed reopening uh, plans for every single faculty, every single building. And many of you were involved. Thank you very much for doing so. And thanks to each and every one of you for adhering to hand washing, uh, keeping your bubble small, staying at home if you're sick. This is not a time for heroes. If you're feeling sick, don't come to work. If you're feeling sick, let somebody know so you can get the, the best public uh, health advice. Um, you probably know that, uh, but I'm gonna repeat it one more time. If you're concerned, if you feel sick or you think somebody else might be exhibiting the signs of COVID, this is what you need to do. Call 811. They will advise you on where uh, whether you need to self-isolate, where to get tested, and they will keep you informed about the testing results. What we're hearing now is that the turnaround time, unlike other parts of the world, is pretty fast, 24 to 36 hours. Call 811, go to the testing site, wait to hear from them, and follow their directions. Uh, it's, it's really, really important. Uh, I will say that there are some conversations, and this will become more appropriate if they're are a number of uh, cases, there are some conversations about potentially having a testing site on campus. But to be very frank right now, the, the number of potential cases doesn't warrant that. Uh, but you know, we have had conversations about perhaps having some kind of testing satellite at UBC Hospital or at Gage Tower. Those are preliminary conversations and they will depend upon uh, need and demand. Um, you, uh, many of you, who interact with students, please reinforce the message to avoid large gatherings and parties. You may have heard that uh, campus security and RCMP had to break up a party uh, on one of the first days after uh, students moved back into Orchard Commons. Um, uh, it, it's not, no fun to, to deliver that message. Uh, we were all first year students at one time. It's an exciting time. It's natural that they want to interact with friends, but It's really very important that the number of people together and uh, the province and UBC prohibits gatherings of more than 50 people. So um, if you're uncomfortable, if you see something messaging that, call campus security and campus security will go to the site and reinforce that it's the law that you can't gather in groups larger than 50. Um, it's, it's, it's incredibly uh, important. So uh, I'm sorry to, to ask you to help, but uh, it's really for everyone's good that we observe those. Um, I'm not going to uh, speak much more about, uh, about uh, the uh, protocols because you're all staff and I think you're familiar with it. Um, told you about the number to call. I hope that, uh, that you, you are confident in knowing that uh, we're open to all suggestions and we've gotten all kinds of suggestions from faculty and staff and we appreciate that on how we can do even better. Um, one example of, of the feedback that has been uh, very, very helpful is, is how we're actually approaching 
air circulation in our buildings. You'll be happy to know that our buildings are fully equipped with upgraded high quality air filters that filter out virus and diminish spread. Buildings operations staff continually inspect those filters and service the building ventilation systems to ensure that they are in good operating condition. That's one uh, step um, that the university has taken. Um, as you probably know, there's, and some of you may be directly involved, um, there's an uh, increase in the frequency of, of cleaning, uh, especially high density areas. Um, and as you know, some of you have been involved, including people in my office, in putting up signs about directionality of movement and reinforcing phys physical distancing. So thank you for everything you've done to implement those procedures. The next thing that uh, we received a lot of questions about um, is the, the topic of systemic racism. So this is a, a very difficult time in civilization. We have a pandemic that's having an economic impact on every sector. Fortunately, UBC is, has not been affected to the same degree as many other sectors. For example, entertainment and tourism, hotels, um, they have been decimated. Um, so comparatively speaking, I hope you appreciate that UBC is doing pretty well. And we actually presented the finances of that at a Board of Governors meeting yesterday. So um, this is a good place to be, not only in terms of a sector, to be uh, a member of the faculty staff, but also it's a safe place to be. Um, because there are a lot of very sophisticated people that have been able to implement these reopening plans. But at the same time, as you know, there have been a continuation of, uh, of uh, shootings and killings that have been uh, racial profiling. Um, and there have been uh, events that have taken place uh, around the world and on this campus um, to, uh, that, that, that have exhibited that there's still racism everywhere around the world. You may have known, have heard that uh, at our Congress on our campus uh, about a year ago, and more recently, uh, a situation with Savoy Williams, a graduate student uh, getting entry into Buchanan Tower, uh, that, um, that we have work to do at UBC as well. And I'll talk to you a little bit about um, what we're doing uh, to address systemic racism. And, and you can see from uh, listening to uh, CBC News or or, or, or international news, that it's something which is happening all around the world. Um, there are protests and marches that are occurring all around the world. So it, it's our responsibility as an institution to recognize that there are tensions and, and for us to address uh, what happens on this campus and to do our part in, in, in taking a leadership role uh, around the world, uh, as well as within the province and in, in, in our nation. I made a series of commitments, uh, and uh, those commitments uh, we will focus on in this year, but in, for many years ahead. I just want to give you an update of what's been happening over the past couple of months. I've been meeting with now hundreds of uh, faculty, staff, and students. And if you want to talk to me, um, let, let us know, and we can uh, address this in, in my responses to some of the questions. But I've met with uh, members of the Black Caucus, the uh, UBC Asian community, as well as an indigenous faculty caucus. And I'll continue to meet and consult with these groups. I've done that as recently as yesterday. This is what's happening. Um, much of, of the concern that has been articulated is occurring within the faculties and the academic and research units of the institution. There are concerns about representation. Uh, there's concerns about uh, the numbers of indigenous uh, faculty, staff, and students, black faculty, staff, and students, um, in every part of our institution. Um, there, is, there are concerns about curriculum. Uh, there are concerns about uh, bias and barriers that exist for employment um, for faculty, staff, and students. The provosts of both campuses have committed as one of their top priorities to uh, thinking about procedures and programs that can diversify our faculty, staff, and students as a key priority. They're working with their deans of each of the faculties, putting in place appropriate resources to support uh, such diversification at every level of the institution. The Black Caucus um, is working with the Equity and Inclusion Office to provide advice. So as you know, uh, we have uh, a longhouse, we have a residential school history and dialogue center, we have uh, three individuals who are just focused on 
the indigenous strategic plan that was just launched just a few days ago. We do not have a similar strategy or investment with respect to black faculty, staff, and students. Uh, we do not have a similar investment as an institution for other underrepresented groups, including um, Asian faculty, staff, and students that may feel unsafe or underrepresented in certain roles. So we're gonna, as an institution, work with equity and inclusion, but also beyond equity and inclusion to see how we can support and provide programming for indigenous, black, and, and other uh, staff, faculty, and students of color, um, and, and to, to think about how we can really uh, make this an even more inclusive uh, community, uh, which I think we are, but uh, that we need uh, additional work to make us even better. In terms of students, I've spoken with not only the provost, but also the VP students and the vice president of development and alumni engagement. We will be uh, creating new scholarships specific uh, for groups, especially black uh, students that are underrepresented at this institution. Scholarships that will support uh, their payment of tuition and fees, but also provide programming support for them so that they feel fully supported uh, once they step foot on this campus. An important foundation that uh, we hope to address uh, in this year and the years to come is something that has been an impediment for far too long, and that is that we have no data uh, uh, in, in monitoring uh, numbers of faculty, staff, and students in different groups. So we're just gonna start to change that. Um, the Equity Inclusion Office will be launching a new uh, Employment Equity and Inclusion Survey in November that includes additional demographic questions that will help us better understand the diversity of our community at every level. And uh, we know from our conversations with the province that uh, this is something that they're gonna encourage to just disaggregate information so we have a better understanding how we're doing in diversifying uh, different parts of this uh, university community. The Equity and Inclusion Office is working with Enrollment Services and PAIR to consider ways to collect better data on our students. And we're hoping to uh, roll out that survey in the next uh, six months. So those are specific steps that uh, will support the commitments that I've made. The last couple of things I wanna say are that um, uh, I've made commitments with regard to campus security. And some of you are on campus security. I'm very grateful for our campus security. You keep our community safe. But in light of, 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 of the incident with Savoy Williams, uh, we need to, on a regular basis, review that unit, just like we need to review every part of this institution. And we'll be launching that review shortly. Uh, the Office of uh, Vice President of Finance and Operations uh, is now in the process of reviewing proposals for that review. We are also cognizant that the RCMP, um, especially uh, most recently this summer, with respect to one of our students of Asian heritage in, in the Okanagan, you might have seen uh, that wellness check that occurred at UBCO. There have been uh, uh, significant concerns raised about how RCMP um, approach uh, members of our community, uh, as well as uh, uh, other individuals who are visitors to this campus. Um, as you may know, I've reached out uh, to the RCMP in the Okanagan. We will be reaching out more with the RCMP here on the Point Grey campus. And we will uh, continue to raise the possibility for shared training opportunities between the RCMP and our campus security to ensure that both campus security and the RCMP are appropriately trained um, in, in how they actually approach those sorts of situations and are, are, uh, are, are, are trained so that they can interact with different individuals in, in an equitable manner. All of this will be uh, captured in a new website, which will be housed on my uh, office President's Office website, president.ubc.ca, that will give regular updates and uh, be a repository for all of these things that we're doing. So that's about it. I wanna thank you all for listening to this. This has uh, been an enormous amount of hard work on behalf of everyone. I wanna thank you for your dedication. Um, I believe we should be very proud of what we've accomplished uh, during these challenging times. Uh, I am personally very proud. Um, and, uh, and I look forward to this year and more than ever, I look forward to getting past COVID-19. I look forward to the treatments that will come from UBC, uh, vaccine, 
uh, and I report, I can't wait for the return to normal when we can have lunch together, uh, enjoy the wonderful food that's uh, part of this tradition and getting to see you once again. So I'm going to stop there and I'm happy to answer questions. And uh, Henry, I don't know if you're going to start. Thanks. Uh, thanks, President Ono. Um, yeah, uh, there are quite a few, and you, you have addressed some of the things that the, the staff, uh, you know, asked about beforehand. But um, uh, I'll start with a couple of questions, actually, with uh, dealing with COVID. And um, uh, one, one staff asked, what would you say is the most challenging aspect of the global pandemic um, for the university, and how do you how do you plan to or addressing it? And so I think that one, you may have touched upon this, but what, what's that, the single most, you know, pressing challenge that you, you think we've faced? Well, I've, I've said a lot about wellness and safety and how I've thanked everybody for playing their part in keeping uh, infections to a minimum. Um, and that's one of the biggest things we can do as a community. Now, I'm going to be very honest with you. Um, as I said, there are entire sectors that are being decimated. And I, I was very frank with you that uh, our sector, but especially UBC, has fared pretty well. And, but I'm gonna become even more specific with each and every one of you because you deserve to have a very transparent answer. Uh, hopefully you've been following uh, my weekly videos and, and my broadcast emails. Um, as you know, things have changed on this campus. Um, we didn't know what was gonna happen in March and during the summer in terms of enrollment. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Enrollment was up during summer. Um, and enrollment is actually up on both campuses for September. Now it could still melt between now and October, but um, all indications are that enrollment is, is very, very solid, number one. So we're lucky about that. Um, many other universities around the world have a 20, 30, 40% hit in enrollment. Um, so um, we're lucky. Um, and that some of our sister institutions in BC and across Canada are really suffering. So uh, we should feel um, um, fortunate that that hasn't occurred at UBC. Um, now, we have, however, taken a hit in terms of, as I mentioned, the number of individuals that are residing in our residence halls, and Andrew Parr's here, um, that has uh, had an impact on resources and shush, um, and, uh, and that has had an impact on the university budget. Um, now, our job has been as an administration to do everything we can to mitigate uh, that financial impact. And uh, you may have heard in my comments to the Board of Governors yesterday, and if not, I'll tell you now, that we've been able to shrink that financial hit, which could have been 300 or 400 million, down to probably 160 to 165 million. That's a huge, uh, accomplishment because those resources we use to run the institution. So it's, it's a huge uh, accomplishment that we should all be proud of to have gotten from a potential hit of 400 million and to decrease it to 160. Um, and um, the university is, uh, has about a $3 billion annual budget. So um, that sounds like a lot of money, 160 to 180 million. But you just have to think about what it is relative to the total budget of the institution. So where we are right now is that probably better than almost any other institution. As you've noticed, we've been able to, 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 uh, to keep moving forward um, and to be resilient. And uh, uh, we will continue to do everything we can uh, to keep costs down so that uh, we can continue to uh, move forward as an institution. So, um, that's been one of the biggest challenges of COVID is managing the economic impact that it's had on the university. But I'm really proud of um, the leadership across the institution that has worked very hard to protect uh, the institution as much as possible. I'll just say, Henry, just yeah, to give you an idea. Some of the peer institutions that have similar budgets are actually trying to absorb a billion dollar to $700 million dollar uh, deficits in the red. And at some point, it's just not possible to manage that. And so um, let's be thankful for leadership that has occurred across the institution to minimize and protect this uh, university from that impact. Thanks. Uh, thanks, President Oro. It's, uh, it's good to get that context as well, I think, for many of us who, who perhaps um, are 
have been consumed by the you know what's going on you know with our own offices and our own units. Um, this one as another that as uh, how have you adjusted your leadership and work style personally uh, to COVID and um, and not totally unrelated uh, and ha has there been a change to in your mind to strategic plans or for strategic priorities uh, from your perspective because of COVID? Um, so there are two different leadership questions. Well, let me start with the first one. Uh, I share my priorities with the university on an annual basis. So if you were watching the Board of Governors meeting yesterday, you would see that there was an addition added to my other priorities. So my other priorities are things such as the Indigenous Strategic Plan or academic renewal or um, integrated renewal pro uh, pro uh, process, so pro the program. So that those, those priorities still remain, but there's a new priority that was added to my annual priorities, which was uh, management of COVID. Uh, so that's something that wasn't expected, but you rely upon me and my executive team and the deans to manage um, our response to COVID. So that, to answer your question, my, my priorities changed because of COVID and, and that's to be expected. All of your, all of your uh, responsibilities have changed because of COVID. Um, in terms of my, uh, my, my work uh, situation, well, like many of you, I'm, I'm on Zoom from, from Norman McKenzie House. So like many of you, I'm remote, uh, uh, fully remote. I've met a few people here and there, but most of what I do is remote. So that has changed. In terms of uh, the impact on my day, it's probably very similar to you. Uh, sometimes I get pretty tired of Zoom. <laughs> and, and, and the problem with Zoom is that uh, the meeting goes to almost the last minute and sometimes it goes over and then you have to be another Zoom. And it's actually, I really think there's a Zoom fatigue thing and Jocelyn is there, she knows that sometimes I said, can I just talk to people on the phone? So I don't know if you feel that way, but, uh, but it's, it's actually really draining to be on Zoom all the time. And we're in Zoom right now, I apologize. <laughs> but um, to be honest, that's, uh, that's, been, uh, that's been something. I actually miss seeing all of you and bumping into you on Main Mall. Um, and that's, that's uh, we had a presentation at Board of Governors yesterday there, where if you don't know, a survey was sent out to all faculty and staff and a remarkable percentage of people responded to the survey about uh, people's views on remote work. And it was remarkable, if, I, I, I don't have the exact numbers, but somewhere around 80 to 90 something percent of faculty and staff actually said that they would like to work remotely either all of the time or much of the time. I don't know if you all agree with that, but that's what the survey results showed. And the participation rate in the survey was very large. And so it's something that we're gonna to have to think about. You know, certainly if you can work remotely and you have a long commute, not having to come to work all the time can be a, a positive. And, 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 and that was articulated in the survey. Um, and, um, and we should, we should consider that. And, and the other thing is that we know that we have a space crunch on both campuses. So if that many people don't wanna be on campus and they want remote work, we should really have an honest conversation about whether to make that available to people who want to work remotely. The one thing that I'll share with you that I said at Board of Governors yesterday is that we have to um, think about um, uh, the consequences, Let, let's say, 80 or 90% of us decide we just want to work from home and we get, our, we get our work done at home. And there may be jobs where that's perfectly fine, but some of you are student facing individuals. And uh, uh, the one thing we can't forget is that they come to UBC and they've said very clearly in our service of them that they don't like this Zoom university. They want to walk around, they want to, come to campus, they want to walk around campus, they want to bump into you. And so for those of you that have a, a student facing role, um, even if you personally may want to be at home all the time, remote working, we got to think about our responsibilities to students and what we take away from their experience if we're just talking to them through Zoom. So that's one thing um, that I'd like to say, but um, those are things that we're going to be discussing in the months ahead. And for some individuals, it may actually make sense to alter uh, our policies so that people can work from home. There are a couple of other things I'll say, uh, because um, I know that, that uh, your staff and these are things that are on your mind. 
um, if that's the model where people work from home, then we have to address things about um, providing support for a home office. You know, there are costs associated with having a, an appropriate chair in your home, appropriate uh, computer equipment. There are issues of security associated with that. We got to work through all those things so that if that's going to be the new normal, that we as an institution have figured out how to be supportive of you so that you can not only work home if that's what makes sense for you and for the university, but when you're working from home that we support you in the best possible way. All those things are things that we're going to discuss in the months ahead. Thanks for that, President Ona. And in fact, you anticipated several of the questions about um, remote work and shifts and, and challenges and, and support as well. Um, I, I, maybe I'll, I'll sort of take one of the questions about supports for well-being. You address things like, um, you know, the home office. Um, do you also see challenges um, in terms of just well-being and mental health in terms of, of not being able to be in social situations, um, to, to run into each other randomly and things like that, that, uh, that Zoom interactions are not the same as, as human reactions uh, to others face to face. I, I'm, I'm just wondering about if, if the new normal, and I think this is a version of a question that was asked, is, or that next normal that's coming, if remote work is a, a part of it, do you see challenges precisely around a sense of community um, uh, that may go missing? So we already have data on that. Um, I can't share all of it, but we already have data on uh, the number of students and faculty and staff that are accessing mental health support. And we have that not only for this institution, we have it for um, the high, entire higher education post-secondary sector. And we have it for uh, information nationally and internationally. The data are clear that uh, in every single case, without exception, uh, the need for counseling and mental health support is going up. Um, you know, I have, uh, I sit on a, a number of different panels and uh, to be honest, that's a, a, a significant concern is uh, people say, though, well, we have this uh, pandemic and then we have the economic pandemic, but uh, the other pandemic that we uh, fully expect is a mental health pandemic. Um, and it's already hitting us and it's gonna get increasingly significant as time moves on. It's one thing to be isolated from everybody and to be stuck in your house for, for a month or a couple of months. It's another to be in that situation for a year or two. Um, it's just human nature. We need each other. As much as we get on each other's nerves, we also, uh, we also most of us, uh, 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 need to interact with others. We need to joke with each other. We need to, to, to like complain about each other with each other. And so that's what's missing in this kind of Zoom uh, uh, environment. So that's the other thing that we need to keep in mind. In addition to, to our responsibility to the student experience, we have to be mindful uh, in, when we survey the faculty and staff that we do it on a regular basis. So that survey might have been done relatively early on when it said, oh, it's great to be at home. Uh, you know, we don't have to commute, but maybe if we surveyed people now, or maybe in February of 2021, the responses might be different because we've been in this new normal for longer. And maybe we've started to realize that we miss that personal contact. So HR is going to be very careful and uh, survey people at different time points to see if there are any changes in people's opinions about this new normal. Um, you know, we, we, we are thinking actively about how to provide more support in terms of counseling, not only for our students, but also for our faculty and staff. We know that uh, the workload uh, has been uh, growing for certain individuals. And, and with that, uh, we fully expect that there'll be more mental health challenges. So uh, we have to really think about how we can provide more virtual counseling and support um, and, uh, and, and that's something that uh, is, is a very good question for that reason. Thanks uh, for addressing that. Um, a slight shift and, uh, and maybe in tone as well is uh, one, uh, one of the people asked, um, what new opportunities do you believe UBC staff, um, faculty and students uh, may see in our new sort of COVID era uh, that we didn't have or experience before the pandemic? And, and so, you know, is, are there some lights at the end of the tunnel or even that are, are opportunities that perhaps didn't exist that only exist because of COVID? 
Well, you know, I, I've actually seen um, a lot of individuals um, step up and come up with uh, very novel ideas about how to uh, provide immediate help uh, for situations that uh, have been produced by uh, the pandemic. There are individuals that are creating apps um, uh, who, that uh, can, can help um, individuals in society identify uh, grocery stores that are not very crowded or when should you be going to Ikea, things like that. So there are faculty and staff and students that are involved in th those kinds of innovations. So the entrepreneurship is, is, is still alive and well during this time. So there are those kinds of, of, of possibilities. Um, I would say, you know, remarkably, um, as you know, UBC um, is very fortunate to have an, a number of donors and, and foundations to support our work. Um, and I also serve as the uh, chair of the United Way campaign for the Lower Mainland. Um, I can tell you that what's remarkable is that support for UBC um, is actually uh, more stronger today than a year ago before the pandemic. Uh, it's, 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 it's extraordinary that people are really stepping up, um, especially um, foundations and, and high net worth donors have really been stepping up and supporting the university. So although there was an expectation there would be a, a significant downturn in support uh, of the university during these times, there's actually a, 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 a swell, a growth in the number of individuals that want to support endowed professorships and, and, and contribute to the institution. So. That, that's a, um, what's the word? It's, a, it's, it's counterintuitive, if that's the right word. And it's a good thing for the institution. I think one of the things is that when people are in need, um, certain people really step up and want to be part of the solution. So I don't know if that's the answer to your question, but uh, that's one very positive thing that has happened. Thank you, President Ono. Um, I, I want to shift the, to a, another set of uh, several people. Uh, thank you um, for speaking out publicly uh, about systemic racism, about black, about the Black Lives Matter movement, about the anti-Asian uh, racism that was uh, that was rising um, at, at after March. Um, and so many actually remarked upon that specifically. Uh, some without a question, uh, but a couple of the questions that did also come with that. Uh, can you tell us about some of the ways? Um, you're encouraging or supporting anti-racism actions in individual departments and, you know, again, as president, you're, you're at a very high level. Are, are you, um, are there some ways in which you're uh, able to encourage and support things that happen more on the unit level or, or down, down, you know, um, where, where activities are perhaps a, a little uh, outside your purview on a daily basis? Yeah, you know, in the ways it's it's harder during uh, this kind of virtual environment because if if it was normal times, I would actually um, talk to Jocelyn and say, please uh, schedule those visits to different faculties, as as you know, I've done over the past several years, so I could physically visit buildings and interact with people and talk to people about how things are going in their in their own unit. I can tell you after uh, my commitments, um, the the number of expressions of concern about potential racist or uh, uh, e even harassment situations went up 300 fold at the institution. And that's not to be unexpected. You know, when, when we opened SV Pro, the number of, uh, of women coming forward and some men coming forward about uh, sexual assault um, or harassment uh, went up several hundred fold. So when you, when you create, when you, when you talk about a situation as a leader and welcome people to talk to you about it or create a, a office to deal with it, um, one of the positive things is that many more people come forward and you can actually be responsive. So I can tell you that after my statement and the commitments made um, that I have a much better understanding of what's happening at this institution. I've also augmented that by my conversations directly with faculty and staff and students uh, in my consultation. So I have a pretty good idea what's going on um, and uh, um, a lot of great things are happening and we're going to continue those things. But uh, to answer your question about about how to monitor what's happening at the unit level. Um, I don't think I've done this yet, Justin, right? I have not yet sent out um, my uh, communication with all deans and, um, and, and vice presidents, but I short, shortly will. And this is what I'm asking them to do, is to provide me with the five top priorities and initiatives that are ongoing, the five that they anticipate to address uh, systemic racism within the next year or two, and then the one, what they, 
hope to do within the next two to five years. So everyone will be providing me with specific actions that they're supporting within their unit area. Um, and they will be revisited a year from now and a year after that. And, and, and so they'll be uh, monitored. On the, on the supportive side, um, I've said that uh, in that Excel sheet, there should be um, a column which actually indicates resource needs. Uh, you can't uh, do a lot of these things. You can't reach out to uh, schools uh, around British Columbia and around, across Canada to try, try to diversify students' uh, representation on campus or to try to uh, recruit uh, staff and faculty to the institution that are currently underrepresented. You can't do that unless you have resources for that programming. So part of this uh, interaction that I'm gonna have with uh, heads and directors and uh, VPs and uh, deans is to get an idea of of what their ideas are about how to, how to um, address uh, racism at the unit level and how we can support that through uh, budget allocations. So that's how, how we're going about it. And, but I will continue to have uh, different opportunities for people at the unit level to continue to talk to me about concerns that they have. So thank you. Um, I, I think that actually addresses uh, or partly addresses a question about um, there are many who uh, are asking if are there ways that they can you know um, make suggestions or submit ideas um, and, and and you know kind of communicate that um, so that's uh, one and and the other is some are seeking you know help and training and will there be um, ways in which if someone wants to learn more um, that you know something that perhaps is uh, is part of uh, of their own education as uh, as employees, as citizens, as as uh, administrators, um, to, so that uh, they can get some support. Or if there's going to be a, a set of courses or training or workshops in that sense, so something um, that the university will will be doing to provide help and support for those who want to um, to learn more. So that's already begun. Uh, the board of governors, for the first time, is going to um, be spending half of a, of a retreat uh, to get their own training in terms of bias and uh, to learn about steps that they can take as leaders of the institution in addressing systemic racism. So the, the Board of Governors is already doing that. The whole executive will undergo that kind of training uh, in the very near future. And then for the first time, I think in any Canadian university, the governors and the executive will get together for a, their own retreat together to discuss uh, how the executive and governors can work together. I anticipate that in future years, um, there'll be training um, at many other levels, heads and directors um, and, um, and managers uh, across uh, different administrative units. Um, I think that one of the things that's under discussion is to make that kind of training available uh, at any time of the year um, to uh, provide it in a, in a virtual way, um, just like uh, we've had training in terms of uh, COVID safety. Um, I had to take that course. I received a certificate because I passed it, uh, an examination. So um, there's no reason why we can't uh, provide it on a regular basis uh, in, a, in a virtual way. So I anticipate that that, that will happen uh, moving forward. Great. Thank you. Um, so, uh, another set of questions I think were, um, A, uh, congratulations for being uh, renewed for a second term. So again, there was uh, quite a few sort of um, uh, uh, messages uh, that, that weren't uh, always attached to, to questions, uh, but uh, when they were, there were some that were um, looking back. Um, are there things that you would like, have liked to focus on that now you're turning your attention to as you uh, enter a second term? So are there are some things that perhaps you didn't realize that, uh, that were pressing issues or, or weren't as pressing, but now for you are, are part of a mandate for a second uh, term? Well, let me first say that I hope you're all proud of what we've accomplished in, in these four and a half, almost five years. Uh, it's extraordinary. And, you know, we're talking about some serious things about COVID and, and systemic racism, but those are things that are not unique to UBC. I'm not saying that they're not important, but we also have to, uh, while we're addressing those things, I think it's important uh, to recognize how wonderful this university is. There is no perfect university. I've been to many. And universities, UBC is pretty darn good. So I think it's important to say that uh, every now and then. Uh, I know Eilish is pretty proud of UBC 
Uh, she's up there in the corner of my uh, my iPad, and I'm looking at it. And I think uh, Isla, she can't. You're muted, but I hope I, I I hope you agree that this is a pretty special place. And 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 I think uh, even though there there are like in any institution things that that have to be addressed, that uh, uh, we have extraordinary people, faculty, staff, and students at this institution. I wish we could hear Alish's laugh or his her voice, but you agree, right? It's it's a pretty special place. So. Um, it's important for us to give ourselves credit for what we are. Uh, we are a shining example for many other institutions. Um, Melinda Smith, who's uh, a chief equity, uh, chief um, a diversity officer at Calgary, said they wish they would have a situation where everybody would honestly discuss the situation, where the governors and the executive would really focus on this. So give ourselves credit for that. Um, give ourselves credit for how we responded to COVID. Um, and we continue to uh, hit the ball out of the park uh, as a research institution. Uh, and we are getting better every single year. And that's because of the staff, all of you. And it's because of the faculty and, 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 um, and uh, the students themselves. And so, um, so in terms of what would I do differently, um, I'm pretty happy with what we've done as a university uh, in this first term. And um, my enthusiasm and belief in the university has just grown. Um, and I hope to continue to bring that with me in the second term and uh, continue, continue to try to make uh, this experience even richer for the staff and, and students at the institution and the faculty, and to make this increasingly a place where people want to work and, and to study. So what would I do differently? Um, you know, um, I think we've done pretty well. So I don't want to second guess what we've done. Um, and uh, we've discussed some of the priorities. Uh, we've been, as a world, we've been thrown at a huge curveball with COVID. I think UBC is going to be a big part of the solution um, in terms of medical treatments. UBC is going to be a, a place that uh, is going to be a model in terms of public health. And Bonnie Henry is our faculty member. Don't forget that. So, so um, I think we should give ourselves credit. Uh, for for all those things. Great, thank you. Um, and, and now there's a little bit of a turn just to give you a uh, fair warning to the personal. Um, and you've mentioned a lot of the challenges and, and I think you intimated that that the screen fatigue and Zoom fatigue was something that was uh, was affecting you. Um, I, I think this is tied uh, to, to that, which is what one uh, staff asked, what is bringing you joy this year? Um, and how do you navigate that kind of work-life balance uh, with all this remote uh, um, work? And you know, I know that uh, you can hear my my kids uh, practicing, um, you know, piano and violin in the back, and, and running around um, looking for for um, drawing utensils. And so there's there's uh, I think a lot of us are, as you mentioned, facing those challenges. But how how are you uh, dealing with it? Uh, I guess people people are curious about your how do you handle Zoom fatigue? How do you find joy in, 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 this, in these moments? Well, for me, um, the silver lining to all this is I've had more time for my family. And uh, I know that sometimes uh, they'll get on my nerves and I get on their nerves for sure. But um, what I would uh, say is that um, really having the time to go for walks with Wendy and Romeo on a more regular basis, there are fewer events in the evening um, that's a positive thing, and it's uh, uh, hopefully that everyone will uh, approach this situation and, and, and just think about the opportunity that uh, being at home more often, the opportunities of, of being better connected uh, with those in your family, um, also the opportunity to really think about your own life. Um, a lot of people are writing books. I'm writing more of my book now as we speak because I have a little bit more time to focus on, on what I want to say in the book. And so uh, it's been a time for me to reflect about um, what I want to accomplish, not only in my job, but as a father and a husband. And so I encourage everyone to take advantage of it. This may last for about a year, and we all want to come back to a new, uh, the way things were, but make the most out of this, we, we think it's going to be a year. Um, and uh, you know, for some, it's uh, picking up a new musical instrument, trying to trying to learn a new new, diff, new musical instrument. For some people, it's it's learning a new language, and there are wonderful apps out there 
that you can use to teach yourself a new language and, and uh, you can take it at your own pace. So I would uh, encourage everyone before they get too down on, on the, that this isn't the way uh, things normally are to look at it in a different way uh, and ask yourself, well, what can I do with this new normal? And what can I learn during this, this, the, the time that might be freed up uh, that uh, will be, will be self, uh, re will, will be rewarding to you and um, that you might, might not normally be able to do. So hope that answers your question. Great. Thank you. Uh, so that's actually uh, sort of exhausted uh, many of the, the questions that came beforehand. And I see we have about 15 minutes or so, 10, 15 minutes for, for perhaps some, um, you know, people who are here, to, if you want to kind of follow up on some of the things that Professor Romo said, or you have other questions that, uh, uh, on topic he didn't address. Uh, there are a couple that have already come through on the, on the chat. And so, um, and so I will pass some of these and, and for those of again, um, I, I think because there's so many gallery pages, if you use the hand up function, uh, Jenny may not be seeing it right away. So uh, perhaps throwing it into the, the, the chat and then what uh, I'll, I'll kind of go through those and pass them on. Uh, there was a, already a question um, that you, you mentioned you know, uh, you're hearing a lot of what was going on and, and an ability to, to, to hear from a lot of people across campus over the last few months about, um, about you know, systemic racism and, these, and, and uh, issues on campus. Um, do you see a way to ensure that um, not just other executive and, 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 and board of governors, but, um, you know, how how can we find ways for other people in administrative positions or managing positions perhaps to to also hear things um that you've heard uh you know and and I, it's a very tricky issue obviously because you know that's that's much closer to to home for many of, of our staff that, and you know and you're dealing with uh with the workplace dynamics but um you know it's it's great in other words that you've heard a lot and have a a kind of now uh bird's eye view of, of what's going on overall. Are there ways in which we can encourage or create ways that uh, uh, other people can hear um, in, in that more direct way? Yeah, I think you gotta be careful. Um, there are power dynamics uh, in play in many, uh, in every institution. And uh, sometimes people don't feel safe talking about what they're experiencing. And, um, you know, so, so we have to be careful and the well-being of every, every member of this institution is, is of paramount importance to me. So everything that's been said to me is anonymous and it needs to be anonymous uh, because uh, we got to protect everyone's welfare. You know, that being said, uh, I'm already starting to expand these conversations so more people are aware of what I've heard. Um, we are, I'm having this president's round table, which uh, includes not just the governors or the executive, but uh, includes uh, uh, associate vice presidents and unit directors. Uh, there, there are quite a few people that come together and we've talked about things like um, migration, immigrant, immigrants and refugees. We've talked about that. We've talked about climate action as a group. So these um, president's advisory group meetings have scores of people um, that, would not, that are not already part of the dialogue at the executive or the governors. So we're gonna start already expanding the dialogue Jocelyn, she can't speak because she's muted, but uh, I don't, you probably know what we're targeting. It's, it'll probably be uh, in, the, in the next uh, uh, several weeks or, or a couple months, right? That we'll schedule that event. She's nodding her head. Uh, but uh, that'll be the sort of like, if you think about it like an onion and the conversations have, have taken place at the, the core of the onion, we will start to expand the conversations and we'll start to use, as you know, I communicate a lot through videos and broadcast emails and podcasts you will see a whole string of podcasts that I will release where some of these stories come to light. In some cases, people are comfortable talking about what they experienced. In some cases, it was something that's been resolved. So I will, putting these, these safety and wellness of individuals who have experienced something um, as my top priority, we will figure out ways to take that onion and actually tell the stories to more and more people through either um, broadcast emails or, or through podcasts or other mechanisms, as you know. So look out for that. 
Thank you. Uh, we've got actually a number of suggestions which I'll pass along. Um, Great. Great. And this is and this is one that I've experienced, which is when you have these back-to-back -back Zoom uh, meetings, you you know, there's no back in the day we used to move between meetings and actually walk and and uh, and think and and relax. And uh, so one suggestion was to actually create a norm of 50 minute rather than 60 minute Zoom meetings to to build in that that kind of gap that that used to be just part of the logistics of uh, getting from one meeting to another now uh, so that was a, a very good suggestion uh, and i would i'd love that one let me um, say that jocelyn knows she's laughing that i already we've already had that conversation so she's already factoring in the time between zoom meetings and uh and so if, if you're trying to get a, an hour meeting with me you won't get it you get a 50 minute <laughs> meeting and uh, and 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 uh, maybe you know jocelyn can you tell T terry that i should actually say that in, uh, in one of my video messages to encourage other people to schedule in time between Zoom meetings. So that's a really good suggestion, thank you. We'll do that. Um, another, another person suggested standing and having sort of a, you know, these moments where everybody's just talking into the screen while standing. Yeah. Um, that uh, I think there's another, a couple of suggestions. Uh, let's see, um, let's see, there's a, I'll, I'll, pat, I'll, I'll keep on looking I'll, for I'll others. Say, the other thing that Jocelyn and I have done is uh, make sure I have time for lunch and make sure I have time. <laughs> we call it office time. Yeah. You know, one of the things that she and I have talked about is that if I have back-to-back uh, -back Zoom meetings, all those meetings have things I have to do. And if I have no time to do them, then I'm doing it in the evening or I'm doing it in the morning. And so she's been very nice to me and she now has office time. So I can actually answer emails and, and, and do the things that I said I was going to do in my meetings. So, so maybe we should, Jocelyn, we should say that in my, in my weekly message too. Those, those are great pointers. Uh, great. Um, I'll, I'll, if, I, if I see others, I'll, I'll group them up and pass them on. Um, I think uh, another uh, person has just asked about, um, let's see, uh, the Indigenous Strategic Plan was launched recently. You mentioned that. Uh, uh, can you say a little bit more about what, uh, how staff can support it? Um, that uh, you know at a, that's a high level plan obviously with a lot of practical um, uh, directions but uh, how can staff help out in particular so what I'd say is uh, first of all if you haven't read it read it it's a, a great plan and it it has action steps in almost everything the university does from um, supporting indigenous students to getting indigeneity into our curriculum um, there's an educational component um, there's obviously aspects that have to do with recruiting indigenous uh, faculty. Um, we're, we're already considered to be a world leader. Um, and uh, if you read it, you'll see that we have very clear plans about how we, there are like 43 different uh, action steps. So it's uh, take a time, take time to read it. And if any of you have any ideas about how you want to contribute, shoot me an idea, uh, an email and, or, or ideas that you might have. And, and we'll get back to you about that. But you will see um, that as this rolls out to the implementation phase, that uh, you will see the fingerprints of the Indigenous Strategic Plan and all kinds of things. You'll see it coming through Senate. You'll see it coming through your units and through your departments. And so um, you will be, every single one of us will, will be doing something to see that uh, through to uh, completion. It's never completed, but it'll be, let's see the Indigenous Strategic Plan come to life. You'll all be involved. Thanks. And actually not unrelated, someone asked about, um, you know, some of the things that you were talking about in terms of both indigenous strategic plan, but also, you know, systemic racism and, and, and equity issues is, is how do you see UBC in terms of its larger partnerships with other universities around um, North America and the world? Uh, do you see us playing a, a role there or is it, or is it first get our own house in order, so to speak, um, for you? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll tell you that um, the number of institutions around the world that want to work with UBC is growing on a daily basis. Even earlier today, I had conversations with Fulbright. As you know, we have a major interaction with Fulbright Canada. Um, I'm the new chair of U15, and I'm also uh, um, responsible for the Association of Commonwealth Universities, um, where I'm chair of the Americas. Um, and so, um, Many people are coming to us from Australia, from the UK, from Asia, wanting to collaborate with UBC on everything from climate change 
to uh, ind indigenous strategic plans and truth and reconciliation. So I think in the next several years, those kinds of interactions, research partnerships and student mobility exchanges will just grow. So I, I believe to answer your question that um, we'll learn from those interactions, but others will want to learn from us as well. And it'll enrich in the experience of our faculty, staff and students. Great. Thanks. Um, we've got a, a question about when your next cross-genre Friday musical collaboration, uh, who, will, who will it be with, uh, or, or who do you have people lined up with that? So some of, obviously it's well, a fan of your, uh, your playing. Um, well, this is a perfect time for me to recruit you. Um, if, if, if you are interested in being featured in my hashtag Songs of Comfort initiative, I encourage you to record yourself. This was started by Yo-Yo Ma. And uh, as you know, he's an incredible cellist, but he started off by playing children's nursery songs on his cello. And, and the reason why he did it was that people were stressed being alone at home, and he was worried about people in senior care. And he figured, you know, what better way to reach out to them by recording himself playing a simple tune and sharing it through YouTube. And so um, I've joined that effort, as you know, over the past several months. Either I play a tune or I play with somebody else and I try to share it. And now we've been adding it to the videos at the very end. And um, now I have uh, people from the community saying they want to play a gig with me. So I had somebody from primary school play a duet in this last video. Um, there was somebody from middle school who's going to be playing something with me. But I would love to play with you. So if, if any of you are musically inclined and, and uh, would like to uh, videotape something together, or if you want to videotape yourself alone, doing anything, singing, playing an instrument, dancing, um, and, uh, and you don't have to be a pro to do it. The, the, what I'm trying to do is to, to uh, share the therapeutic effect of music and art with others. That's Yo-Yo Ma's idea. And we have so much talent everywhere in this institution. So please do uh, email myself at sjo at ubc.ca or Jocelyn Beretta at jocelyn.beretta. And um, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure I'm going to spell it correctly. It's, uh, can somebody unmute Jocelyn? Is that possible? Can, she can also perhaps drop it there. into the chat. Yeah. You What's your email address, Jocelyn? Uh, Jocelyn, J O C E L Y N dot. Beretta, B-E-R-E-T-T-A at ubc.ca. I'll also put in the chat. Great. It's a long name. Great. We would love to have some of you guys featured in my hashtag Songs of Comfort initiative, either by yourselves or with me. And you'll be featured. Uh, that email on Fridays goes out to, I don't know how many people. It must be a couple hundred thousand people. So if you want to, if you want to have an audience of a couple hundred thousand people, this is your chance, and I, we would love to feature you. Thanks. Uh, okay, so all of you who have uh, some talent, uh, please do uh, get in touch with uh, Jocelyn. Um, so uh, another suggestion uh, coming from Andrew Parr that uh, about putting no meeting blocks, uh, you know, eating blocks, lunch blocks, snack, uh, thinking, catching up on email blocks. So to schedule those in, I think. Uh, uh, that's uh, you know quite a few people I think have been finding these little ways to make sure that uh, you don't schedule yourself into endless uh, Zoom nine to five. Um, I think another person actually was telling me that they just refuse to have any meetings after five p.m. was as basically a kind of no meeting. Uh, you know that you know the boundary is the boundary, and that was it. Um, did you hear that, Jocelyn? Did you hear that, Jocelyn? <laughs> <laughs> no, a no fly zone right after five. Um, when do you? Okay, so this the, another uh, question that came through is uh, we we heard formally sort of what was going to be second semester um, uh, plans. Uh, do you anticipate that there's this moment of when summer 2021 will also be announced? That uh, you know, there's a kind of moment for you already scheduled. In, in you know that this is where a, a decision will be made and announced. Um, so is that is that moment uh, already in your mind? Yeah. So you've probably been tracking that. Um, you know what we're monitoring is is uh, what's happening with COVID. Um, the the number one consideration is the health and safety and wellness of our community. So we made the call on January 
about four months in advance. So you, you can do the math. Um, people are asking what's going to happen to graduation in May. So, uh, you know, uh, Eilish will tell you that's a huge production, a lot of work, right? So uh, they have a lead time they're going to need to know from us. And if I don't tell them, they'll come to me and say, well, we need a decision on what we're going to do about those uh, graduation ceremonies. So um, there's that kind of lead time that's necessary. And the best we can do, because we don't have a crystal ball, we don't know what's going to be happening in May, the best we can do is the data and information that we have uh, when we have to make the decision. And I gotta tell you, a lot of people were concerned about a decision to go remote um, in March and to go remote in September. Um, many people are saying, boy, was UBC smart uh, to be conservative. And so um, I, more than anybody else, want, want everything to go back to the way they, they were as soon as possible, but I'm not gonna prematurely commit the institution to something that might put us all in the harm's way. So I hope that gives you gives you some kind of an answer. So we'll, we'll do the best we can, but we have to make the decision well enough in advance that ceremonies can put on the graduation or faculty members can instruct and uh, staff members can uh, help uh, with everything that goes into being face-to-face. -face. Thanks, President. So we've probably got time for one more question um, and one more comment. One was uh, someone wanted to say that uh, seeing uh, President Ono sitting in his living room in his white socks playing his cello was a calm and reassuring center point in the confusion and especially in those early months um, you know, adjustment to COVID. So, so a thanks coming. Uh, I, I don't know if white socks is, is a particular part of that uh, uh, and if you have different colored socks and there's a plug for white socks. But uh, again, I thank you for, for, for again, you know, being, uh, being there in that way. Uh, I think uh, uh, perhaps this is a good last question, which was, you know, what's the thing that's brought you the most joy <laughs> during this? Time. I mean, if there's one single thing that uh, that you can think of, you, despite all the of what's going on for the last six months, uh, what's you know, is there something that uh, you can share with us as a, a really happy moment that you'll 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 treasure? You're gonna laugh, but um, you see, like many of you, I have a daughter. I have two daughters, but one of them is at university. I have a younger one that's in secondary school. Her name is Sarah, and so um, she's at home all the time, um, and uh, so one of the things that we've done is work on projects and some of you may know that uh, um, she's uh, entering grade 11 and she didn't have a desk in her bedroom and so you know teenagers need desks in their bedroom so she also wanted to have a proper bed frame and so we have spent time going to ikea and i'm sure you've all built ikea furniture you know where there's like the most important piece is missing or you didn't measure something just right, it doesn't fit in the space it was supposed to be. Have you done that? So for me, the biggest joy has been uh, going back and forth to Ikea with social distancing. It's kind of awkward, but, uh, but then actually getting the boxes and then and working together with her to assemble the bed frame and to assemble the desk and assemble the shelves and making mistakes here and there. But it's, uh, it seems ironic, but that, those are the small things that uh, for me have been the biggest joy. Thank you so much. I think that's uh, that's hopefully a a message to us all to enjoy the little things. Uh, for me, it was re redoing our kitchen cabinets uh, with my wife and kids uh, over a few weekends in a row. And yeah, you know, now now I see it every morning, and it, it does uh, give me a little bit of joy. So thank you for that. Um, I want to again ask everyone to join me in thanking President Ono for again launching us into this year. Um, I want to also uh, thank again the SJC staff for backing this up and for the hot lunch committee for again your devotion uh, to this. Um, I also want to raise that for those of you who need to come to campus to do things short term, um, SJC actually we are still, we have over 100 students um, but we also have some room um, for staff to come in for, you know, uh, to if you need to stay overnight uh, while coming from wherever you are to, to do some work on campus. And I'm, I'm sure also Andrew Parr uh, is here that, uh, that, you know, we have some rooms also, uh, other accommodations in their conference and accommodations as well. So to also think about, uh, about that and, and to, to talk to Stacy Barber, um, if you do need to come in and, uh, and spend a, a day or a couple of days, Again, it, for those I think who need need to you know plan long term about uh, working remotely and yet also 
uh, need to, to come to campus. So um, again, thank you so much uh, to President Ono. Um, and yeah, hopefully someday soon we'll, we'll, be, we'll have that picture on screen that we'll be able to eat together um, and again, have a world around our table. Uh, but in the meantime, we're, we're so uh, glad that uh, uh, President Ono, you've, you've, been, you've shown such leadership uh, through these difficult times and, and really, uh, you know, the sign of a great leader is, is how they handle adversity and how they, you know, uh, bring people together. And so our, our thanks and gratitude for, for what you've done over the last six months. And uh, we look forward to everyone seeing you next month uh, at, at Hot Lunch again. So look out for the announcements. And uh, again, uh, you know, our appreciation to President Ono for, for launching this year's uh, Hot Lunch series. Thanks, everyone. All the best.